Hey, I'd like to welcome you to another episode of Mission Matters. My name is Adam Torres. You can follow me on Instagram at Ask Adam Torres. And if you'd like to apply to be a guest on the show, just head on over to missionmatters.com and click on Be Our Guest to Apply. All right, so today I have Aaron Alejandro on the line and he's Executive Director of Texas FFA Foundation. Aaron, welcome to the show. Hey, good to see you. Thanks for the invite. This is awesome. All right, Aaron. So uh, I'm excited to get into Texas FFA Foundation. Uh, as I always say, hey, we have Texas on the show today. It's going to be a great day. So excited to have you on here. And uh, just to get us started, uh, start this show with our Mission Matters Minute. So Aaron, we at Mission Matters, we amplify stories for entrepreneurs, executives, and experts. That's our mission here. Aaron, what mission matters to you? That's a great question, and you really constrict us on the time, but I love it because it really makes us think about how do we define our mission, and for me, it's really easy. I tell people all the time that whether we're talking about Texas, California, America, or the world, uh, we're, we have three vital and renewable resources, youth, agriculture, and leadership. Our mission at the Texas FFA Foundation combines all three. We form not only well-rounded leaders today, but dynamic influencers tomorrow. The bottom line is this, in just about 32 more years, we're gonna need about 80% more food than we have today. There's not gonna be 80% more land or 80% more natural resources. We're gonna to have to have some brilliant minds. And I'm excited about the mission that we have because we get to empower those young people that will lead into the future. Man, that's great. I, I love bringing uh, a mission based uh, entrepreneurs, organizations, business owners, and just, you know, caring individuals on the show to talk more about why they do it and their mission and, uh, and you know, why they do what they do. So that's awesome, Aaron. Um, and just to get us started. Um, so we'll go further into, of course, Texas FFA Foundation, but let's let us know a little bit more about Aaron. So how'd you get started on this journey? Well, Adam, that's a that's another really good question. And to be honest with you, I, I could have never planned the journey that I'm on. Uh, I'm very fortunate. And uh, and maybe maybe my passion comes from my experience. So I appreciate the question. In a nutshell, here's how it happened. I, I come from a broken home in Dallas, Texas. I remember my father left us when I was six years old. Uh, he passed away when I was 10 years old. There was a big age difference between my mom and I. Uh, so she struggled to try to keep me under control. Uh, this was back in the 70s. Uh, rock and roll was at its peak. And so you can't tell it now. But back then, I decided to grow my hair really long. I got into a lot of trouble. My mom tried a lot of different resources. She tried the church. She tried big brothers and big sisters. She tried several things to help correct me, but it didn't work. Mm -hmm. Finally, on September 3rd, 1980, she said, I've warned you and I've warned you and you haven't listened. So now I'm going to take matters into my own hand. Mm -hmm. We went to Luffield Airport in Dallas, Texas. We got on a Southwest flight, flew from Dallas to Amarillo. Mm -hmm. Amarillo, they put me in a van and drove me 36 miles into the country to a place called Cal Farley's Boys Ranch. When I got out to Boys Ranch, uh, I went to a dining room where there were five, about 400 boys and staff members in this dining room. And I remember I'm in the dining room and we had lunch. They introduced me as the new kid. And of course I had this long hair and they told me that I needed to say goodbye to my mom. And I remember in front of 400 boys, I just looked at my mom and I said, see ya. But that, that was the extent of my toughness was see ya. Now there's a Paul Harvey version of the rest of the story. And I can tell you that about two weeks later, I was on the phone crying, begging my mom to get me out. <laughs> we left the dining room and we went over to the counselor's office. And on our way to the counselor's office, we made a pit stop uh, to this woman. Her nickname was Abdul the Butcher. And she cut all my hair off before I went into the counselor's office. I go into the counselor's office. I'm sitting there. And uh, this boy walks by the counselor's office and he says, hey, are you the new kid? And I said, yeah, I'm the new kid. He goes, what dorm are you going to be in? I said, well, I'm going to be in Bridwell dorm. And the guy goes, ooh, Bridwell. And I said, what's so ooh about Bridwell? He goes, have you not met your dorm parent yet? And I said, I have not. I said, who is it? They said, his name is Mr. Chandler. I said, well, tell me about Mr. Chandler. They said, he's about five foot nine. He weighs about 185 pounds. 
He bench presses over 400 pounds and he is, he is the hairiest man you've ever seen. <laughs> I'm sitting in the counselor's office. Obviously I'm scared to death. It's like the kid sees a ghost. He's gone. This big old cowboy turned the corner and he said, hello, darling. My name's Winston Chandler and I'm going to be your daddy for the next four years. Mm. And my jaw hit the ground. He said, darling, out here at the ranch, you got to take all your basics, math, science, history, English. But at Boys Ranch, you have to take a vocational program. Mm -hmm. uh, I had never heard of a vocation. I didn't know what that meant. It, it sounded a lot like vacation. I really kind of <laughs> thought that might be kind of a fun thing. Uh, we had two programs at Boys Ranch. We had Skills USA mm -hmm. and we had FFA, which was Future Farmers of America. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, so tell me, what do they do in Skills USA? They said, well, they build houses and work on cars. I said, that sounds pretty good. I said, future farmers of America. I said, listen, man, I'm from Dallas, okay? I'm no cowboy. That's probably not for me. And I'll never forget Mr. Chandler. He, he had such great wisdom on life. Mm. He said, darling, you're never going to learn anything unless something depends on you. So I'm going to put you in ag, in agricultural science education in the FFA. I never signed up for it. Mr. Wow. Chandler put me there. Now, I got to tell you that, Adam, for two years, I had a pity party. And I know you've got <laughs> listeners out there that understand what a pity party is. It's where we sit around feeling sorry for ourselves. And I was mad at God. I was mad at everybody. I was like, you know, why am I here? Why am I 36 miles from the nearest town? You know, why is Grizzly Adams my daddy? Why am I wearing boots? Why am I in agriculture? And then I went to a leadership workshop. Mm. And I went to this leadership workshop and a state officer in the FFA, he saw me. I was that kid that sat in the back of the room that didn't say a whole lot. Mm -hmm. And it's just like your audience, Adam. You never know what's going to be said that's going to be the most important thing for somebody at that point in their life. Yeah. And I remember the state officer looked at me and he said, Aaron, he goes, you're 16. In two years, you're going to graduate. What are you going to do with your life? And I don't know why at that moment, but it made a lot of sense. Yeah. I went back to Boys Ranch that year and I ran for chapter office. I was the treasurer. My senior year, I was chapter president. Hmm. I got ready to graduate high school May 21st, 1984. Nobody in my family had ever gone to college. Wow. So I asked my teachers, I said, what does it take to go to college? I think I want to try this. They said, well, I needed to take an ACT or an SAT. Mm -hmm. uh, my first question was, which one's easier? They said the ACT. <laughs> I said, sign me up for the ACT. So 35 Boys Ranch seniors, we go to Amarillo, not for the purpose of taking a test. We go to Amarillo because we knew if we went to town, we didn't have to work. The food was better and we could enjoy <laughs> our environment. So the quicker we could get done with the test, the quicker we could enjoy things. So I bubbled in very quickly. I bubbled in a 14 on my ACT. For those that know, I did not knock the top off my ACT exam. Yeah. And Adam, I would also ask that if your listeners are, are, are listening and paying attention, I would tell you this. There's probably some people out there just like me that are very hard headed. They said, Aaron, you can take that test again. I said, nope, I think I'll do this the hard way. So I've got a 14 on the ACT. I go to my mom. I say, mom, nobody in our family's ever gone to college. I'd like to go to school. And my mom said, well, let me help you. She gets her checkbook out. And she wrote me a check for $25. I've got $25 and a 14 on my ACT. <laughs> I always ask people, you know, well, what were my odds of going to college? And it never fails. People will say slim to none. Yeah. No chance. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing, Adam, that you talk about entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. And I think one thing we really need to remind this country of is that I grew up in a time where you told me I could be anything I wanted to be. Yeah. I grew up in a time where you told me my future wasn't tied to my family situation or my mom's checkbook or, or my ACT score. You told me that I lived in a country where I could do anything I wanted to do. The only friend I had at that time was that blue and gold FFA jacket. Hmm. And I zipped that jacket up. And I remember I tell people, I said, when I zipped that jacket up, it leveled the playing field. You didn't know that I came from a broken home. You didn't know yeah. that I got my dinner out of a garbage can. You didn't know that I had a 14 on the ACT or $25 in my checking account. Mm -hmm. When I put that jacket on, zipped it up, I had the same opportunity as everybody else. And by God, I was going to do it. 
I went down to Houston, Texas and stood in the Astro Arena behind a podium and lectern so large you couldn't see me. And I stood up in front of a crowd of 8,500 people and I told them why I wanted to be the state FFA president. Mm -hmm. And in 1985, 86, I was elected. Wow. And as a result, I went back to Texas Tech University that year on five scholarships. Wow. Now, I tell you that story mm -hmm. because I do what I do today because somebody did that for me. Mm. That, that's why I do what I do. Uh, let me go one step further, Adam, and a little more personal. Uh, I remember one time I came home from school mm -hmm. and I found my mom's car in the yard. She shouldn't have been home. Yeah. And I remember I worked my way to the back of the house and her bedroom door was cracked. Mm. And I get my height from my mom. She was a tiny woman. And I remember I eased the door open and I found my mother on the foot of her bed on her knees in prayer, okay. wailing out to God. And when I tell you my mama was wailing, I want you to know she had tears coming down her face. Mm -hmm. She was wailing. And she said, God, we have no food. Please bring us something to eat. Please bring my son some food. Please bring us some assistance. But the words that I will never forget is when my mom said, God, would you please just give my son an opportunity? Mm. Will you please give my boy an opportunity? Mm. Now, fast forward years later, my oldest son, his name is Chandler. Yeah. My oldest son, Chandler, and I were working in an orphanage in Chihuahua, Mexico. Mm. And I remember I asked the lady that ran the orphanage, I said, sister, what do you need? Do you need food, clothing, medicine? What can we help you with? Sister, what is your prayer for these children? And I'll never forget what she said. She said, Mr. I just pray that these children will have an opportunity. Wow. So Chandler in about fourth grade, it was bring your daddy to school day. What does your daddy do? Mm -hmm. Well, how am I going to answer that, Adam? I live in a <laughs> town where we've got NATO pilots. We've got doctors and lawyers, policemen, firemen, really mm -hmm. cool jobs, nurses and doctors and teachers. And then we've got Chandler's daddy. He's a professional beggar. You know, how, how do I explain to fourth graders what I do? And I remember I went up to the board that day and on that whiteboard in that classroom, I drew a little bitty door mm -hmm. and I asked those fourth graders, I said, could you get through that door? And they said, no, sir. Mm -hmm. And then I drew a really big door. Yeah. And I asked those fourth graders, I said, now, how many of you could get through that door? And they said, yes, sir. Mm. I said, that's what I do. I make doors bigger. So mm. for the last 21 years, I've been the executive director of the Texas FFA Foundation, and we have made doors bigger today than ever in the 94-year history of the Texas FFA. We've got more leadership mm. development programs for students. We've got more opportunities in scholarship, $2.4 million in scholarships annually. We've Man. got more opportunities for our teachers to grow professionally than ever before. So when you ask me, Adam, what is my story? Yeah. I hope that my story provides some insight on why I feel like God's given me a purpose to serve yeah. through agricultural science education in the FFA. Wow. So, I mean, that what a story, first off. It takes somebody um, like you with that type of dedication. I mean, that vision, the amount of time you've been with the organization, the, um, I mean, the planning, the the thoughtfulness about ROI on the on the return or the return of an investment for you know the sponsors and all the other people that make this happen. I mean, it's not easy. And I I want to get, I definitely want to get into the weeds on this and I want to go deeper into Texas FFA Foundation. But maybe um just to just to start, let's start at maybe a higher level because I don't want to assume that all of our all of our listeners or, or um, visitors here today have the vantage point of understanding what's going on currently and just um, agricultural education in general, whether it be in Texas or the United States. And so you have really, in my opinion, a really unique vantage point um, of that kind of what's going on. You have a pulse on it. So, I mean, like, what, give, give us an update on what you're seeing for the state of education overall for, for ag science and agricultural. Well, the, the first thing, I think the most important thing is that we're growing. And I, mm -hmm. I, I love using that word when we talk about agriculture, but, <laughs> but the reality Fun is intended. we are. We are. We're growing. We're, we're, we're growing in numbers. We're, but, you know, going back to the purpose, we're really growing people. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and I'm always fond of saying people that know me and follow me, they always know that there's two things I always talk about. I say, number one, live your brand. Yeah. So no matter what you see around Aaron Alejandro, I hope that you see that I'm living my brand. And then number mm-hmm. two, I tell people all the time, if you want to know what the future is, grow it. Yeah. You want to know what this country is, grow it. You know, Abraham Lincoln, they attribute a quote to him and it says this, Abraham Lincoln said that the philosophy of the schoolroom in one generation will be the mm-hmm. philosophy of government in the next. So what we do here is what we can expect here. Mm-hmm. So I'm proud to say that in the 20 years, 21 years that I've been with the Texas Ag Science Education FFA, I've watched it grow. Uh, we're, we're now in the state of Texas and, and also nationally, I know that their numbers are up as well. Mm-hmm. But within the state of Texas, we've got over 219,000 students enrolled wow. in agricultural science courses. Our Texas FFA membership mm-hmm. is just over 139,000. That, that means wow. that one in six FFA members in the United States now live in the state of Texas. Mm. And it's not, a, a lot of times people think, well, if it's agriculture or it's food, it's farming and ranching, it's rural. Yeah. Not true. When you look at the programs that we have in the state of Texas, the largest concentration of our programs are in the Houston area, Mm. San Antonio area, Dallas, Fort Worth area. And I think that probably a pivot that we made a few years back, there's going to be some viewers maybe that that, that have talked to their grandparents or maybe there's grandparents Mm -hmm. on here that will remember uh, vocational agriculture one, two, three, and four. That's Mm. what I went through back in my day was vocational ag one, two, three, or four. We have such a more dynamic platform today. Today, Mm. students can take semester courses in equine science or wildlife wow. management or floral design, uh, plant science, animal science, uh, food science. So the platform has changed. And by changing that platform, mm-hmm. it's attracted more people to that program. Another way of looking at it is like this. Think, think of it this way. They mm-hmm. asked Wayne Gretzky one time, you know, Gretzky, what makes you such a great hockey player? Mm-hmm. I loved I loved Gretzky's answer. He said, you know, most players skate to where the puck is. I skate to where the puck is going. And when I think about the future of our world and I think about the necessity mm-hmm. of food, I could not think of a better profession to be in right now as a young person than to learn something about food, how mm-hmm. it's made, how it's distributed, how it's marketed, how it's how it's transported, because I'm telling you, with the hungry world is going to come incredible opportunities. Yeah, I see that. And that's that's an amazing stat. So one in six. I mean, you're, you're doing something right over there. That's for sure. And I like I like the idea of what you're saying about the platform um, expanding and evolving into different things, because I feel like there's a lot of industries, I think, that have gone through this, specifically agriculture, um, manufacturing in the United States, for sure. Like, you know, let's just say. And, and I'm in Los Angeles, but let's just say some of your Hollywood branding, right? If you see on movies, everything that you has to do with agriculture is somebody on a farm. If you see everything that has to do with manufacturing is somebody in a dirty welding shop or something like that. It's just not true. Like, like welding shops and all that. Like, I mean, not saying that doesn't happen, but I mean, manufacturing is like robots and it's amazing. And there's beautiful, clean, like tech, like driven factories. And the same thing with agriculture, like so much has just changed and there's just so much opportunity that I feel like like some of the branding and one of the reasons I was happy to have you on the show today is I, it's an opportunity to change some of the branding around how the youth look at these at these positions and look at like what they're actually doing and are able to fulfill different roles in the world. One of the one of the things that you just said right now and it's connection to Los Angeles that's the reason why I'm going to tell you this we've got a donor that they made a movie about it starred Val Kilmer and and John Grice, you know, Uncle Rico from Napoleon Dynamite and, and Elaine Hendricks from The Parent Trap. But anyway, we made a movie about a guy named Dick Walrath. Mm-hmm. Dick Walrath, matter of fact, yesterday was his birthday. He's 91 years old yesterday. Wow. He's given over $27 million in scholarships to Texas FFA and 4-H members. Amazing. They made a movie about him. Well, the executive producer, he's from California. And he asked that question, Adam. He said, can you help me? really understand ag science education FFA and the opportunities. I said, I'd be glad to. I said, meet me at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. So he flies into Houston. He meets me at the Houston Livestock Show and Rodeo. They have a building there called the NRG Center. Okay. And I'm not exaggerating when I tell you that building 
is probably a half a mile or three quarters of a mile long. It's huge. We started at one end of the building and we walked to the other end and I turned to him and I said, Jay, how many different species of animals did you see? Wow. He said, well, I don't know. I said, well, let's talk about it. Let's see. You saw dairy. You saw beef. You saw lamb. You saw pork. You saw chicken. You saw rabbits. You saw goats. And he's going, wow. Yeah, I saw all those species. I said, now, Jay, within each species, how many different breeds did you see? Hmm. And he said, Aaron, I have no idea. I said, we saw Angus and Red Angus and Brangus <laughs> and Simital and Simbra and, you know, Rambolets and South Downs. And, and I just went on and on. And I said, Jay, every one of those, they have their own marketing groups, their own international footprint, their own professional trade association. And I'll never forget it. He looked at me and said, oh, my God, Aaron, there's so much opportunity in agriculture. And I said, this is the story that doesn't get told. And Adam, you hit the nail on the head. When we allow the media and mm -hmm. emotional intelligence to stereotype who we really are. Mm -hmm. and so the fact that you were kind enough and your people were kind enough to reach out to say, hey, would this be a platform you'd like to tell your story? Absolutely. Because I can tell you, I work with CEOs of major brands. Mm -hmm. Uh, I've sat in their boardrooms. We've had these same discussions, Adam, and I can tell you they are just as interested in the fact they know what the food needs of this world are going to be. Mm -hmm. And they know we've got to have young people that can step up to the plate, be entrepreneurs, be innovators mm -hmm. and be influencers to feed a very hungry world. Absolutely. Amazing. Um, and, and great story. I'm sitting here thinking about like this producer going through that, going through this whole thing, like mind blown on all, all we see is what, uh, you know, fill the dreams or something. I don't know. <laughs> so let's go further into, um, into Texas FFA Foundation itself. So I want to go deeper into that. So um, for those that aren't as aware, like maybe give us a little bit of the history and the background of, of the organization overall. Very good. Yes, sir. So uh, the Texas FFA Foundation started back in 1968. And, and what happened, and I say started, wasn't founded yet, it started. There was an oil and gas man walking down the streets of Fort Worth, Texas. Hmm. And he saw all these blue and gold corduroy jackets. At that time, it was all boys. And he saw them all going into the Fort Worth Convention Center. So he never told anybody that he was there. He just went inside and he worked his way up into the stands and he sat and he watched the Texas FFA convention. Hmm. He was so taken by the performance of the people, their confidence, their speaking ability, that he said, you know, I think I want to support them. And wow. so he wrote a small check. Okay. A few years later, an attorney shows up in Austin, Texas, and he indicated he was there to execute the will of Mr. C.J. Red Davidson. And when Mr. Davidson passed, he left some oil and gas stock to the Texas FFA. That money became the original corpus of what became the Texas FFA Foundation. Wow. So in 1987, we formed the Texas FFA Foundation. Uh, we have had three directors. I'm the third of three. I knew the other two directors. Uh, Royce Botterford was our first director. Mm -hmm. Derwin Hill was our second, and I've been the third. And we've had, obviously, some successful benchmarks since then. In 2000, mm -hmm. uh, we formed a think tank called the FFA Leadership Council, mm -hmm. where we visioned everything that we could for the Texas FFA. Now, at the time, this is kind of an interesting backstory, Adam. At the time that I served on that think tank, mm -hmm. I was working in a prison with truant offenders, and I worked in a boot camp. Wow. So I was just there offering my input, mm -hmm. but that's when they offered me a job. So in 2000, that's when I took the job of the Texas FFA Foundation as part of the discussions that we had. We launched a capital campaign. Our goal was to raise $3.5 million. And I will tell you for an organization that their typical fundraising is selling fruit and sausage and cookie dough, to tell people we were gonna raise $3.5 million was really a thought to a lot of systems. But I'm going to tell you something. Mm. I've never backed down when it comes to sharing the dynamic mm -hmm. organization called the Texas FFA. I've got one donor that always tells me, Aaron, there's a gold in them jackets. And he's not just talking about finances. He's talking about talent. So we launched this capital campaign with the thought that maybe we could reach $3.5 million. Mm. Well, at that time, the FFA had never had a million dollar donor ever, mm. not just Texas, nationally. 
They wow. never had a million dollar donor. We wrote a proposal to Ford Motor Company and Texas Ford dealers for $1.3 million. And the first million dollar gift in the history of FFA came to Texas. Wow. That million dollars became the catalyst to the second million dollar gift, which became the catalyst to the third million dollar gift. When I started, Adam, our endowment was just over three million dollars. Today, our endowment is over 15 million dollars. Mm. We have grown it substantially historically because we recognize that when we walk into a sponsor, whether it's a philanthropic gift or a marketing gift, whether mm -hmm. it's cause marketing or somebody that just wants to be generous, mm -hmm. number one, we're going to show them an attitude of gratitude. Mm -hmm. We are going to, we're going to brag about their brand. <laughs> Trust me, I'm going to shout it from the rooftop. Oh, yeah. That, that this company has stepped up to the plate, mm -hmm. that they are investing in our young people. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody that knows me knows that I don't drive anything but Fords. I stay in Wyndham properties. I wear nothing but Justin boots. I get my farm and ranch materials from McCoy's. I get my Western wear from Cavendish. Everybody that knows me knows it because it goes back to living your brand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and, I, and I, I don't mean to sound real simple about this, but I really do believe it. I tell sponsors all the time at the end of every dollar, I don't mm -hmm. care if it's a million dollars or one dollar, mm -hmm. at the end of every dollar, you're creating an opportunity for a kid just like me. Hmm. That, that provides fuel. That, that right there for me is passion because yeah. it challenges me, Aaron, what can we do different? What's a new idea? How can mm -hmm. we engage people? How can we be innovative so that we don't look just like another nonprofit coming hat in hand saying, yeah. give me money. I want to do things that people recognize as dynamic, as mm -hmm. best practices, and I would tell you historically, Adam, that's how we've grown the Texas FFA Foundation. So, Aaron, I want to take a slightly different approach here. So um, I want to, you know, one of the things that makes things so unique, I want to bring in some of the other players. So specifically the students and the teachers. Now we could take this from, you know, a couple different angles and we can start wherever you want. But essentially, like what makes the students and, and or the teachers so unique that are involved with the Texas FFA Foundation? Great question. And, and, and I love sharing this answer, by the way. Mm -hmm. So I, I think you, you have hit something that I really like the opportunity to brag about what we do, <laughs> brag about our students and brag about our teachers. Mm -hmm. I remember one time I was in Fort Worth, Texas, and I was pitching a proposal of a very large company with a footprint across the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. The gentleman that I spoke to, he listened intently, didn't show much emotion, never smiled like you do, Adam. He just mm -hmm. sat and listened. He had his HR person there and um, I'll never forget it. When I finished, he took his glasses off and he looked at me He said, Aaron, that was a fine presentation. Mm. He said, you guys in FFA and agriculture and you, you, you act like you have a lock on leadership. Mm -hmm. You act like nobody else does what you do. He said, doesn't band teach ensemble? He said, doesn't mm -hmm. sports teach teamwork? Mm -hmm. Doesn't UIL teach speech and debate? He said, what makes your kids different than everybody else? Yeah. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. So here's the story that I told him. I said, I'm going to answer your question with two examples. Mm. One day outside of the community that I live in, I went to a coffee shop where the old men gather mm -hmm. and, and they cuss and discuss everything that's wrong with our country. <laughs> and so these old guys are sitting around and they're cussing and discussing. I'll never forget one of them said, Alejandro, I'll tell you what it takes to put this country back on track. We mm -hmm. got to get back to the basics, the three R's. And I said, what are you talking about? They said the three R's, reading, writing, and arithmetic. And if we'll, if we'll get back to the three R's, we'll put this country back on track. And I looked at them and I said, gentlemen, I mean you no disrespect, but I work in a boot camp, I work with truant offenders, and I work in a prison. Everybody that I work with can read, write, and do math at a functional level. I said, but you're absolutely right about the three R's. But it's not reading, writing, and arithmetic. I would argue that it's respect, responsibility, and resiliency. I believe if we can teach a young person to respect themselves, their fellow man, their community, mm -hmm. to be responsible for themselves, their family, their state and nation, mm -hmm. and to be resilient, learn to get up when you've been knocked down. I got news for the world, these young people. Not everybody gets a trophy. 
Yeah. We, we've got to be resilient. And I said, sir, I think that within ag science and the FFA, we do a good job of teaching that. Mm -hmm. I said, but let me give you a specific example of what makes our students and our teachers different. There was a blizzard blowing in on the Texas Panhandle. And I remember Mr. Chandler came to me and he, he handed me a sledgehammer. He said, darling, I need you to drive to the other side of the ranch and bust the water trough for the horses. Hmm. And I said, Mr. Chandler, I don't want to go. There's a, there's a blizzard blowing. I can barely see the, the wind. It's like a razor cutting through the skin. Mm -hmm. And I'll never forget Mr. Chandler and his old country wisdom. He looked at me and he said, darling, do you get thirsty when it's cold? <laughs> I said, yes, sir. He said, don't you think those horses get thirsty too? Hmm. I said, yes, sir. I drove five miles that day through this hmm. blizzard and I busted the water trough for the horses. <laughs> I looked at this gentleman in Fort Worth, Texas, and I said, I'll tell you what separates our kids from everybody mm. else. Because in our world, if we don't do our job, something dies. Mm. In the world of agriculture, in the world of farming and ranching and food, mm -hmm. if we don't do our job, it dies. And mm. if it dies, that means an economy dies. Mm. It means a society can die. What we do and what makes our kids unique, Adam, is the fact that we give them a core value Mm -hmm. through a classroom experience. A lot of times people ask, well, Aaron, what makes FFA and Ag Science so unique? I said, think of it like college where you mm -hmm. would go to lecture in the morning and you'd go to lab in the afternoon. Yeah. So our students go to an Ag Science classroom, mm -hmm. but then after they leave that classroom, then they participate in leadership activities through the FFA, mm -hmm. where they may have to get up and give a speech about their product project or mm -hmm. a product or where they might have to engage in parliamentary procedure or agricultural mm -hmm. advocacy or marketing and public relations, mm -hmm. or they may actually choose to raise an animal or to yeah. be involved in a, in a business in, in, in either as a placement or as an entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. So I think that's what really makes our kids and our teachers unique is that they are working in a core value structure that they will take with them for the rest of their lives. My, my first intern, he went on to become an officer in the Marine Corps. Mm. And I'll never, I'll never forget it. He was over in Korea and he was mm -hmm. commanding uh, some, some troops, troops over there. And he said, Mr. Alejandro, I never forgot you telling us that story mm -hmm. about how something depends on us. And he said, sir, I may have changed from the FFA jacket to a Marine Corps officer jacket, but now other lives depend on me as well. Mm. And I, I never forgot that. And, and I think the thing that made me proud about that moment is whether it was my own kids, which I'm so proud of my children, mm -hmm. uh, the fact that they've been involved in ag science and FFA and they've learned to take care of animals because I have seen firsthand how they take those mm -hmm. core values into their families, into their community. Mm -hmm. And they know that something else, it's not just about them. Mm -hmm. And I really think that's what makes a difference in our kids. Man, that's a, that's a big deal. Um, it's a big deal. And as I'm listening to you, I'm sitting back thinking about some of the differences and, and also the, the teachers and just the whole infrastructure that makes this possible. Um, give me a little bit more on the idea of linking brands and, and what that means to support Texas FFA Foundation. So what does it mean to support the foundation? Yeah, so anybody, and, and I know we can talk about this later, anybody can go to our website. It's just mytexasffa.org. Mm -hmm. And on the mytexasffa.org, they're going to find some incredible videos, by the way, award-winning videos. You're going to see, um, you're going to see our various sponsorship packages. Mm -hmm. But we, we try to find a place where any sponsor can come on board, Adam, and know mm -hmm. that whether I'm given at the highest levels or at the lowest levels, whether... Mm -hmm. I'm contributing to your scholarship endowment, or I'm just making an honor gift to honor somebody. Yeah, uh, I would tell you that's that's the one that's really interesting is to watch people give honor gifts. Mm -hmm. um, but really, what I think we've done, mm -hmm. I think our message, I, I think our strength of messaging of our core values, yeah. respect, responsibility, and resiliency, has attracted companies that say that's what we want to support. Mm is respect, responsibility, and resiliency. So all of a sudden these companies come on board. Well then, you know, we, we announced Ford Motor Company. Well, one of my board members is the largest independent cotton ginner in the state of Texas. Now, mm. when you think about ginning cotton, we're talking about 
blue jeans. I mean, you're talking about, yeah. denim. I mean, that's a lot of, that's a lot of stuff. So think about that. He's the largest independent cotton center state, Texas. When we did the deal with Ford Motor Company, mm -hmm. he flipped his entire fleet <laughs> from another brand to Ford. Wow. Well, why did he do that? It did not necessarily because it made financial sense. Mm -hmm. He did it because he recognized. And the thing that I can tell you over the years is, you know, what, La Quinta Hotels, we started with the royalty program with La Quinta. Mm -hmm. That program went well over a million dollars. It's now wow. part of the Wyndham portfolio. Uh, Justin Boots came on board. So I can tell you that time and again, whether it's Prefort, I mean, I remember Eddie Prefort, the president of Prefort, mm -hmm. um, they were at our state convention and, and Eddie said, Aaron, this just feels right. <laughs> and I said, what do you mean? He said, a lot of times you go to these conventions and conferences and if you're a sponsor, you know, you're, you, you don't really feel all the time comfortable. You're, yeah. You kind of feel like you're just there because you're there kind of as the, they're going to prop you up. He goes here. It's like, everybody's working together. Mm. Everybody cares about these kids. He goes, it just feels different. Uh, we're working on a documentary right now, a film project with a company, and the owner of that company came to our convention this year, and she said, Aaron, she goes, I've been to a lot of conventions. Mm -hmm. She said, I have never been in an environment like this, and I said, well, what do you mean? She said, I've never seen sponsors that are so eager to be here as sponsors. She mm -hmm. said, you can tell they genuinely want to be here. They're excited about being a part of this, and I think, Adam, that is where I tell people that's that's where you get to see where your investment meets return. Mm. And when you can see these young people saying yes, sir, no, sir, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, when you could see them with their pride in their country, their mm -hmm. pride in their sponsors, their pride in their capabilities. Yeah. It makes you it makes you realize that is the news necessary? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you there's a lot of good news out there that never gets reported. Oh, that's amazing. And, uh, and I can tell you, I agree with you on that. And uh, I'm excited to have you on the show so we can, we can do our part to get your message out there. And that, so that being said, so, so what's next, Aaron? I mean, a lot going on with Texas FFA Foundation. You're growing. Um, you know, more people are coming to support the message. The student population is growing. I mean, one in six um, for FFA in general, nationwide. That's a big deal. Um, what's next? Well, I, I would say, you know, let's, let's talk immediate goals. So immediately, obviously, we've got some projects that we're working on. Mm -hmm. We've got a history project. I'm working with another couple of sponsors that I'm hoping to be able to announce here in the very near future. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll have convention. We'll already start planning for the 94th annual convention wow. uh, that will come up this summer in Fort Worth, Texas. By the way, Adam, our Amazing. convention, our convention, which I'd love for have you come out. If you want to come out and see it, trust me, you will not regret it. It's the largest youth-led convention in the state of Texas. Mm -hmm. There'll be over 14,000 people there for the whole week. The kids do wow. everything. The adults, you never see us. The kids do everything. It's a full stage production. We give out $2.4 million. Over 2,500 wow. students will walk across the stage uh, and be recognized for a good job. Let me come back to that one, but they'll be recognized for a good job. But we'll be, we're working toward the convention. Uh, it's, it, it's in the top five conventions in the state of Texas. It's the largest youth-led convention in the state of Texas. Let me tell you why I say that that walking them across the stage is such a big deal. When I used to work in the boot camp, I remember one time I had a pretty rough character there. He, he's, he was a pretty rough guy, and he was a gang member. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'll never forget it. One day the guards told me, they said, Aaron, they said, uh, this, this young man needs to talk to you. And I yeah. said, okay, are y'all going to be standing by? And they said, <laughs> they said yeah. So they, they took this boy down a hallway where he, he wouldn't be seen by his friends. Mm. And I turned the corner. I said, what can I help you with? Mm. In his words, I will never forget. He looked at me. He said, Mr. A, he said, uh, I've never met my dad. Mm. And he said, you know, my mom, she tells me that she loves me. Mm -hmm. And then this kid just broke down. Mm. He said, sir, he goes, I would give anything to hear somebody tell me they were proud of me. Mm. And I get to tell our sponsors every year wow. that we walk 2,500 kids across that stage. Mm. And in front of 14,000 people, we tell them how proud we are of them. Mm. You can't, 
you can't recreate that kind of environment or greatness. You just have to experience it. So what's next? I don't know. If you're looking for my next big idea, I'll throw it out there. You never know. Y'all may have somebody that wants to do it. The agri-science fair in Texas has really got a lot of notoriety. We have people that come and go through the agri-science fair. We've had attorneys walk through there and say, hey, can I patent that research? They see the entrepreneurial spirit of our kids, which is mm-hmm. another reason I love your show. But I've got this idea to create a million dollar Texas FFA shark tank. Mm. There are 12 areas in Texas. And what I would like to do is I would like to get it where each of the 12 areas send a, a project to the state convention. <laughs> they will pitch that project in front of a panel of expert CEOs of some of the companies that we work with. Mm-hmm in hopes that we may provide a little seed money out of this million dollar endowment. The goal one day, Adam, would be that we would go from blue jackets to blue chip. Mm. So when you ask me what's next, that's my next big idea. Oh man, that's a big one. Uh, The shark tank, this is exciting. That that is a big idea and I can see it. And and you can see the, it's, it's just win-win. I mean, for all people consider are, are involved, the, the students, the ideas, the United States, the world, we don't know what kind of innovations can come from that, but we know that this is where a lot of innovation starts, right? Sure. Um, in the minds of our youth and just a different way of thinking and learning and, and attacking a problem from a different angle. And uh, I see it and I'm excited, like this is good. And, uh, and, and it doesn't exist yet. So I'm just gonna say that we, you heard it here first, maybe probably, okay. not, but, but that being said, seriously, Seriously, um, I'm excited about this and uh, continue to support Texas FFA Foundation um, in any way we can, of course. Um, that being said, I know you said it earlier, but I want to make sure we get it in there one more time and um, and we will before we wrap up. And uh, of course, it'll be in the show notes and things like that. But if somebody's watching this and they want to get involved and they want to support, what's the best way for them to do that? Uh, the easiest way to find us is on mytexasffa.org mytexasffa.org. Also, you can find us on just about every social media platform. And I'm not hard to find. Anybody that looks for me, uh, I'm either on the internet somewhere under Aaron Alejandro or Live Your Brand. And uh, I just, again, I appreciate the opportunity to be a part of your show and to share our story uh, on another very dynamic platform. Amazing. Well, Aaron, uh, really appreciate you coming on today. And uh, to the audience, as always, I hope you got a lot of value out of this. I hope you uh, you learned a lot. I know I sure did. Um, and if you don't forget, if you're a first time visitor or viewer, then hit that subscribe button. We have many more mission based uh, entrepreneurs, executives and experts coming up for you, and we don't want you to miss a thing. And Aaron, it really has been a pleasure. Um, thanks again for coming on the show. Thanks, Adam.